And thus Rowling tries to wrap up this clusterfuck of a story by making everything even more absurd, starting with Harry's foster parents who are sent to safety. After all these books, they remained the same one-dimensional evil idiots, and they are now simply removed from the story without changing their minds or being punished for everything they did. All Rowling did was having someone scolding them for being bad caretakers while they are not saying a word in defense. Such wonderful characterization, Rowling. I totally believe these are real people. They are sunset thanks to Harry, but only because he had saved his life. Anyone would have done that. Thanking someone doesn't count as character development, and the reason he was attacked by a fiend was not the result of him being a stupid bully. Meaning the child molesters and the school bullies escaped and lived happily ever after. Justice prevailed, children. And if you think that didn't make any sense, get ready to find out how 90% of this book was a wild goose chase. Rowling had no idea of how she could fill 800 pages and just stuff the story with impersonators and imitations of the items everybody was looking for. This did not make things more exciting. It only wasted hundreds upon hundreds of pages by going in circles and making the plot even more convoluted than it already was. 1. Harry transforms into a ginger kid and many others to Harry lookalikes in order to confuse the villain of who is the real one. He then transforms into a wizard working in the ministry so he can infiltrate the building. And then he gets captured by the villains making this whole plan pointless. He might as well have been captured right away. 2. There was a pendant which was switched with a fake one, hidden in a house where it was eventually found by the villains. You are practically reading a hundred pages of a complicated plan that had zero story progress. There was no point to even go after it in the previous book, only to find out it was fake. 3. Harry needs to destroy the pendant by using the sword from the second book. But guess what? The sword which is kept in a treasury is fake. The real one is hidden somewhere else. So we spend hundreds of pages in solving riddles, which could very well be interpreted in any way you like, until they find the sword in the middle of a forest. Once that is done, it is revealed that there is a chalice which they also need to destroy. And do you know where that is? In the treasury, right next to the fake sword. They needed to go there regardless. Four. I am not even done yet, it gets even more convoluted. Even when Harry gets to the treasury, he doesn't even get to use the sword. It gets destroyed, thus making the quest pointless. 5. I am not even done yet, it gets even more convoluted. As soon as he loses the sword, it is revealed that he could have simply used the teeth of the basilisk he killed in the second book, something which was much easier to find than the sword, rendering once again the quest for the sword completely pointless. And wait a second, if the teeth are so powerful, why didn't Dumbledore or anyone else take its teeth all these years? This entire quest could have been skipped if Rowling hadn't forgotten the chamber up until now. 6. I am not even done yet, it gets even more convoluted. Another item Harry needs to destroy is a tiara, located inside a secret room, which of course none of the adults could find. He gets the teeth, goes to destroy it, and turns out he didn't need the teeth or the sword, because there is a spell that can destroy the items just as easily, making both quests meaningless. Best part is that the one who used the said spell to destroy the tiara was an ally of Voldemort. 7. I'm not even done yet, it gets even more convoluted. The only excuse for Harry to know where the tiara is located is by vaguely remembering his site in an area with millions of other stored items. Yeah, such great evidence totally excuses why you can pinpoint exactly where it is in a huge room by casually looking at something for a few seconds without being aware of its importance. Great writing, Rowling. 8. I am not even done yet, it gets even more convoluted. The allies of Voldemort were waiting to ambush Harry by staying in that room for months. How did they know he will go there? Why didn't they simply take the tiara to a safer place first? Why did they use a spell that can destroy it? Why didn't anyone else find them all this time? How could they even be there if the place was refusing entrance to the supporters of Voldemort? If they found the room before the other teenagers used it as their base and made it Voldemort proof, why didn't they inform the evil wizards about it when they knew about it for over a year? And above all, what the fuck were they eating for months in that place? Did they even have a bath? It didn't even have a toilet for crying out loud. 9. I am not even done yet, it gets even more convoluted. Aside from trying to find the seven items that hold Voldemort's power, everybody was also looking for three artifacts, which are again replaced all the time, so nobody's certain which are the real ones and who are the current owners. By the time they figured out what is going on, the artifacts didn't matter anymore, so they might as well never had existed. Not to mention how Rowling threw in an extra quest and a bunch of background stories at the last moment, which was making everything needlessly complicated.
said, and amidst this bullshit is Harry freaking Potter, behaving equally as evil as Voldemort did. Just list the things he did in this book and compare them to what the Lord of all evil was doing all this time. It's the exact same thing. And yet Rowling presents all that as heroic and thinks nobody's going to notice that because Voldemort looks like a fucking zombie while Harry is a victimized orphan. Fucking bullshit. And of course, the reason all that were possible is because there is no defense against anything in this stupid setting. 1. There is no defense against the mind control spell. You can control anyone to do anything you want, even if it's against his will. 2. There is no defense against invisibility or transmutation. Anyone can impersonate anyone else he likes, and nobody will suspect a thing. You can infiltrate the most secure places on Earth in minutes, because nobody pays attention to the magic alarms or has invented an anti-magic barrier. 3. There is no defense against elf magic. Even when Harry is imprisoned in a room that blocks teleportation, a house elf appears and frees him just like that. Why are they slaves when house elf magic is far more powerful than wizard magic and can do any shit they like? They can take over the world easier than Voldemort did. 4. There is no defense against rebellious teenagers. As always, kids at the magic school were not obeying the adults, the teachers had no way to control them or find the radio station they were using for mocking the authorities. Also, teenagers could easily fend off huge armies of monsters despite being the rookies who didn't know of a single offensive spell up until two years ago. 5. There is no defense against the secret passages. Hogwarts is filled with secret rooms nobody could find for a thousand years, and when Harry finds them pretty easily, they are constantly used by the rebellious teenagers, and again nobody else could find them. The adults kept saying that they blocked every single secret exit in Hogwarts, and yet Harry and the teenagers kept using even more exits to easily go in and out anytime they wanted. They even went as far as evacuating the whole school despite being under siege by a huge army of monsters. 6. There is no defense against good. Did you notice that throughout the whole story there are a dozen ways to fend off evil, but nothing to fend off goodness? The secret room the teenagers were hiding in was Voldemort protected, meaning nobody who was evil could get in. On the other hand, the Chamber of Secrets from the second book, created so it can be used only by the Slithering, does not have protection against any other faction. 7. The bad guys have defenses that work only against them. They use monsters like basilisks and dragons, and spells like Fiend Fire that can destroy the items holding Voldemort's power. No beast on the side of the good guys ever used its power against them. Furthermore, even after the Chamber of Secrets is revealed and the basilisk is killed, nobody from Voldemort's side bothers to take away the corpse despite knowing very well of its power. Also, the special password one must use to get into the chamber is in Snake Tongue, which despite being hyped up as something super Super special, anyone can get into the chamber by simply repeating the words without having to actually know the language. And of course, it's so simple to remember something you heard once, five years ago, without feeling the need to memorize it. This plot armor is insane! The good guys can do anything, the bad guys can do shit. 8. There is no defense against faking death. While Harry was faking his demise, nobody bothered to check his pulse and make sure he's really dead. 9. And even in that single time when the adults finally try to protect something, the booby trap they use is overkill and causes more damage than benefit. Now let's talk a bit about how good Rowling is at writing romance. Hermione falls in love with Ron in this book because he abandoned her. Next thing you know, she French kisses him while they are ripping off the teeth from a five-year-old rotting corpse of a basilisk. That's so romantic, Rowling, having them kiss for no reason while everything around them stinks like shit. Let's also talk a bit about her wonderful exposition. Remember Snape, who betrayed them in the previous book? Turns out he was faking it, that's right, another fake, and that he's actually a good guy. Something that we, the audience, find out when he is already dead. He didn't even do something with his double-crossing, because Voldemort killed him before he had the chance to move against him. And Voldemort didn't even kill him because he found out he was a traitor. He just did it for fun, effectively making Snape's side story completely pointless. After that, the final battle takes place and you're left wondering, when did these rookie teenagers learn all these powerful spells when two years ago they couldn't even weigh their wand properly? Most of them were not even mentioned or explained before. And why don't they simply spam the enslavement spell? It's easy to cast and can turn the enemy against himself. Or better yet, why don't they all drink the luck potion and sit back as the monsters get killed by their own attacks? See what happens when you abuse magic?
And then we finally get to Harry fighting Voldemort. This has to be epic, right? It's the final battle, it just has to be. And it isn't. Harry wins by doing fucking nothing. Voldemort's spell bounces back and kills him in the exact same way as before. Fucking horseshit! Harry did zero things in the whole story and the villain defeated himself three times in a row. These books are garbage and anyone who still defends them is a filthy casual who doesn't like good storytelling, logical plot, proper foreshadowing, proper action scenes or anything related to good writing. The end!